Hey everyone and welcome back to Turner Mobile Detailing. In this video we are in beautiful Boulder, Colorado nom, 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 nom. to attend a two-day advanced training seminar. Today is day one. I'm on my way to meet my Uber ride. Today on tap is going to be wet sanding, dry sanding, advanced techniques in rotary usage and uh, gear driven polisher usage. So really excited for all that especially the wet sanding portion of the training. That's really where I wanna focus my learning over the next couple days. And then tomorrow our schedule consists of all day DA random orbit training. So really looking forward to that um, and overall the theory over the next couple days. So I will keep you guys informed. Uh, I will show you around the facility when I get there in a few minutes as much as I can, as much as they'll let me. I know there are some restrictions as to what I can film and what I cannot. So. I'll get what I can and I'll take as many notes as I can for you guys and I will share with you what I learn as much as I can. So I hope you guys are as excited as I am. I will see you when I get to Rupes. We are now pulling into the business park in which the Rupes facility is located. And it's quite a large business park. And finally, after about 2,000 miles of travel, we finally arrived at Rupes. Okay guys, so I just got dropped off here at the Rupes facility. We are in Louisville, I believe that's how you pronounce it, Louisville, Colorado. Let's head on in and take a look around. So if you've seen any of the Rupes Replies or Rupes Bigfoot 101 video series on YouTube, you'll probably recognize the training facility here. Totally state-of-the-art carts and workstations direct from Italy, not to mention the overhead lighting rig. For our first day, we've got training hoods to work on here that get sprayed and resprayed again for the students of the class by a local Votech school. Now check out the awesome state-of-the-art wash bay where real-world practice vehicles get washed and prepped for students to work on. Now heading inside the classroom area, you'll probably recognize this wall as a common backdrop from many of Rupes' YouTube videos. On display is their full line of electric and pneumatic sanding and polishing tools, not to mention accessories. Not gonna lie, this wall definitely made me drool a little bit. And then on the opposite wall on display are a number of entries and winners to the Rupes second annual Art of Bigfoot competition where world-renowned automotive painters and airbrush artists were invited to create their own unique design of Rupes's flagship Bigfoot LHR 21. Also on display were some vintage Rupes sanders and polishers, and we learned that Rupes was actually the first manufacturer of the electric powered buffer. So each day begins with classroom theory. Day one began with Rupes history and industry leadership. The first question Dylan asked everyone is how to pronounce Rupes. Given some people's propensity to pronounce it Rupes or Rupees, but actually learning where the name Rupes comes from was very interesting. It's actually an Italian acronym, meaning Manufacturers of Specialty Pneumatic and Electric Tools. We also went through different aspects of Rupes' history, which was founded in 1947 in Milan, Italy. From innovating their way through the world of sanding and polishing in Europe, to changing the world of paint correction and polishing in 2010 and 2015, in particular with the Bigfoot line, the LHR21, and the Bigfoot Nano Hybrid, respectively. In 2015, Rupes opened the North American facility, a state-of-the-art manufacturing and training facility right here in Louisville, Colorado, USA. We got a sneak peek at the factory this morning where we learned that not only are all Rupes machines fully fabricated, tested, and even repaired in-house, but also why Rupes machines are considered the Cadillac of machine polishers. Not only are they engineered to a finite degree, 
but each individual motor is individually balanced to make sure that the machine is going to perform with the greatest of ease and deliver the most effortless user experience. So the reason why Rupes machines have less wattage than most of their competitors on the market is because the motors are perfectly balanced. The LHR 15 and 21 only run on 500 watts, the gear driven Miele on 900 watts, the rotary on 1200 watts, and the Mini and Duetto only run on 400 watts. Even with lower wattage, Rupes outperforms the competition because the balancing of the motors and the machines as a whole allows 100% of the wattage to translate to the surface you're polishing or sanding instead of being lost in vibration. That's why competitor manufacturers offer higher wattage because it's not only a marketing ploy, but they have to offer the higher wattage to compensate for the amount of energy that's lost in the motor's excessive vibrations. And finally, we all discussed what we individually wanted to get out of the course over the next two days. So now let's head out into the shop where we started with some hands-on theory and training on dry, wet, or damp sanding. So this in-shop session consisted of the difference between dry sanding with sanding film discs and wet or damp sanding with foam-backed sanding discs and what the different visual indicators look like between the two on the natural finite texture of clear coat. Let's take a look. Uh, but your readings on your paint gauge are gonna be really high because these hoods go out and then come back. Um, so we'll paint on paint on paint on paint. So there will be probably 15, 20 mils on your, that's not just that take a belt buckle. And... You pretty much can, I mean. All right, so let's recap on what we worked on in there. If I'm about to sand this, what is the first thing I need to be doing? Measure paint. the paint. Clean it. I can assume that most of these hoods have been cleaned, but let's not make any assumptions. So your guys' first assignment, once you get over your own hoods, is going to be to soak them with alcohol. You have a bottle that is labeled. Yep, this is just highly diluted isopropyl alcohol. It's like four or five repaints on one hood. Your readings on your paint gauge are going to be wildly not realistic. They're just a tiny bit of paint to work with. Yeah, good guess. But I bet you if I measure a few plates on this because it's high school, yep. 11. So 11 over there. 12. Nine. Nine. No. Wildly inconsistent. They're, they're overlaps. So wipe that away. See in there? So I only hit the peaks. See it starting to disappear now? So right about there, I am level. That's all the water I'm gonna use. I might even do that, that's about it. Yeah. So you need shiny spots? Because I am sanding the peaks and the valleys. So what I'm looking for is a white slurry. It'll take a few minutes to get going and then once it does, so there it goes. See that white? That's clear coat. So I am now sanding. I'm really cut. This is what freaks people out. Same grip, 1500, 1500. This one sanded, peaks and valleys, made a nice, even, consistent, dull spot. This one I had to do a few times before I actually got leveled. So your leveling process is even going to take longer because it's going to take more passes. Essentially, this is because the film sanding disc is rigid right to the backing plate and doesn't conform at all to the texture of the paint. So it levels the peaks of the texture, leaving behind an inconsistent sanding mark at first. The foam-backed sanding disc conforms to the valleys as well as the peaks, touching 100% of the surface at a time, thus leaving behind a more consistent sanding mark. Foam-backed sanding is recommended for isolated defect repair because it will not change the appearance of the paint's texture, thus allowing the spot to blend in with its surrounding areas. Now, if I've done a good job of refining my sand mark, you should start to see reflectivity. So move your head around on that, yeah, you should be able to see a light bulb in that. Yeah. So my difference between my 1500 and my 3000, yeah. less than a mil difference. Than a mil difference. Uh, yeah. With all that saying, I mean, and that was, that's an excessive amount. So what do we have now? Yeah. So after this little training session, we got to put it all into practice on our own test hoods. Here I'm using the Duetto. It's really the ideal larger electric sanding tool because it's got a five inch backing plate, which means it gets into smaller areas easier than a six inch wood. And it also has a 12 millimeter throw, so you can be that much more precise when working up against edges and convex body creases. Something else we discussed is how while wet sanding, 
you can see much better the scratch or the paint defect you're trying to remove more accurately. You can actually see when it disappears, if in fact it's shallow enough to disappear. So you only remove the amount of paint or clear coat that's necessary to do so. While when compounding, often it's much more difficult to see the scratch through the compound, so you're much more likely to remove more clear coat than is necessary. So personally in my business, I think I'm going to be replacing the compounding stage with a wet sanding stage for any two-step paint correction jobs. It was also reinforced to us that when wet sanding, you always want a foam interface, whether you're using a dry sanding disc or a foam back disc. Next, now that I made a nice uniform sanding area with 1500 grit, I wanted to test out what level of foam on the rotary would be necessary to remove said sanding marks. On a side note, another benefit of wet sanding is that you create a uniform surface of scratches at a certain grit level. Anything deeper than that isn't coming out anyway, so to speak. So after you polish out your wet sanding scratches, you know you have everything polished out that was able to come out. And most tunnel wash scratches or love mark scratches are the equivalent to about 1,000 to 2,000 grit. So that gives you a good starting point once you've measured the paint to see how much you've got to work with and depending on the condition of the paint that you're starting with. So as usual, I wanted to start with the least aggressive approach. In this case, it was with the yellow foam and yellow fine rotary polish. It did refine the surface, but unfortunately it could not remove 100% of the 1,500 grit sanding marks. So I could just try a half step up in aggressiveness and only change the liquid to the coarse compound and keep the yellow pad. But in this case, I felt that the remaining sanding marks were still severe enough. I wanted to step up to the blue foam along with the blue coarse rotary compound. Blue Course Duo did the job on the 1500 grit sanding marks, and quite well I might add. It left behind a surprisingly glossy and clear finish with zero holograms, even on dark colored paint. Next, Dylan stopped by to offer me some advanced rotary techniques. Check it out. I'm working right up to it, because I have the control, especially on the high side. the other side then this side's the harder side so this is the one where I'm a little bit more just being real light with my touch and trying it because your bulkier defect is going to be on the high side right this one this is such a steep angle so you can almost use the curve of the pad and not even touch the like if you look at that I'm not on the edge I'm actually just down in the valley so I'm safe to be down there for as long as I want to be So after the day was done, they let us hang around and get some additional shop time in if we wanted to. And of course, that's exactly what I did. Here you see me using the Mini with a three inch backing plate. This machine is the other quote unquote full size machine that is a must for any kind of polishing, no matter if you're wet sanding, compounding, or polishing. In this case, I'm wet sanding with some 1500 grit and 3000 grit foam sanding discs and a three inch foam interface. Something else to keep in mind is that especially when working with electric machines, Electric motors have more torque than a pneumatic machine, so especially while wet sanding, you want to use very low speeds, preferably speed 1 or speed 2 at the highest while wet sanding. So similar to earlier, I wanted to test and see how the different foam and liquid combos did against the 1500 and 3000 grit sanding marks. Again, I was really amazed at how well the blue core system both cut and finish, especially on dark paint and with no hologramming. The fact that we were allowed to stay after with the instructors was an awesome bonus. 
Shop time, hands-on, is the best way to refine technique and application skills, so I was really glad it was an option to get more time working with the different tools and products. Again, hands-on. All right, guys, so we are wrapping up day one. My head is exploding, so I've got a big day tomorrow. I'm gonna go home or back to the hotel, get some dinner and get a good night's sleep. And we'll see you tomorrow for day two. All right, so it is day two of the Rupes Advanced Training Seminar. I'm heading in now, just got dropped off. So I will keep you updated throughout the day. I'll get as much footage as I can and uh, let you know how it goes. See you later. So day two began much the same as day one. A session of classroom theory. This time it was all about the random ornament machines, their design and how to properly use them. And then as you see here we came out into the shop and began putting that theory into practice. Today we get to work on two real world vehicles. So we got to put our training to practice on real world cars with real world defects that were pretty hammered and with some pretty bad swirls and scratches. We got to practice reading paint feedback from panel to panel as we polished. Given the fact that rental vehicles often have panels here and there that have been repainted or resprayed and are not factory clear coat, so they will respond differently than the other panels that have factory clear coat on them. So we got to learn how to make the adjustments for those differing areas. So since day two was all about the DA random orbit machines, we can only use the 21, the 15, the Mini, the Nano, or the Duetto during our shop time. Here you see me using the LHR 15 Mark III, a machine that I personally own, and I wanted to see how the Blue Course pads perform in valleys, since the Blue Course foam has the most learning curve because it's the stiffest out of their foam pad range. I did get some stalling, but I expected that because the blue foam doesn't quite conform to the valleys as easily as, say, the yellow or the white foam pads. Now I switched over to the 21, and honestly, I didn't think that there would be that big of a difference between the two machines, but I was surprised at how different the 21 feels compared to the 15. The 21 is an absolute beast. That thing has the same motor and wattage of the 15, but the 21 millimeter throw just makes it feel much more powerful to me anyway. And I had less issues with the stalling and valleys than I did with the 15. Even with the Blue Course foam pad, which I know seems counterintuitive, but that was my experience. A trick we learned to help prevent pad stalling is to apply just a hair more downward pressure. How this works is that a little added downward pressure helps translate the machine's energy through the pad to the surface. With too little pressure, the foam pad especially can absorb the tool's energy into itself and it stalls or stops spinning. But be careful how much pressure you put on the pad. Too much pressure can cause the pad to absorb too much liquid too fast which will reduce the amount of liquid you're working with on the surface. It'll prematurely clog the pores of the pad and it can add excessive weight to the pad, which can throw off the balance of the machine, potentially even creating more wear and tear on the gear set and counterbalance inside the machine, potentially shortening its life. A good rule of thumb is that if you do apply a little bit more downward pressure on the foam pad, make sure not to compress it more than 50% of its thickness. As you just saw me inspecting the paint for defects before I started polishing, I want to mention a point about lighting that was actually discussed during a day one shop theory session. Someone brought up the lights that mount directly to the front of a polisher, and Dillard made mention that having your inspection light at a 90 degree angle, or in other words directly between your eye and the paint substrate, is not the best way to view paint imperfections. And those lights that mount to the front of your polisher easily throw off the balance of the overall machine. The best way to position an inspection light is to hold it away from you, positioning it at a 45 degree angle to your eye. This angle highlights the paint defects the best, so you can accurately see what you have to work with. Another good rule of thumb that'll help you work more safely, both for you as the user and for the surface you're working on, is you want to maintain the lowest speed possible that will still maintain or allow the pad to spin. Typically, Rupes recommends speed 2 to prime, 
and speed 3 to 4 for normal operation, depending on your preference. Speed 5 or 6 should only be necessary if you're trying to power through a valley that's causing you to stall and technique alone isn't helping. And now for our final inspection. Holding the light at a 45 degree angle up away from my eye, I can see the surface much more accurately and I can see a nice swirl free finish. Something that was pretty cool on day two was that we got a sneak peek at a couple of Rupes' new release for this year's SEMA show. I personally got to use the new Hybrid 3 inch Mini and as you see here, Dylan demonstrated the new line of microfiber DA pads. That was our finest compound in one step. So that's ultra fine compound, ultra fine microfiber. One stage. One step with a really, really slow, heavy pressure application. So something else that was really reinforced was proper edge work, meaning any areas of the car that are either on the edge of a panel, smaller areas, or narrow areas. Also an interesting comparison was made to painting a room when doing edge work. When painting a room, you typically cut in or paint all of your edges first. Then you roll or fill in the body or the large open areas second. The same process should be done when polishing a vehicle. Polish all your edges first and then go back and polish or fill in the body or the large open areas second. And as you see my camera slide right off the hood. For edge work, the Nano and the Mini, which you see me using here, are perfect. They give you much greater control and precision in tight or in delicate areas and greatly reduce the risk of possibly burning an edge of a body panel. Now something like this, the mirror cap, obviously I could use the mini also. I've even used a 5 inch or 6 inch machine to polish mirror caps, but the Nano offers so much more control than any of those other machines, even over the mini. Especially on a surface like this, that's almost 100% convex. I personally prefer the rotary configuration of the Nano as it just allows for a little faster results and that much more precision. Again, as you see me here working on a door handle, the Nano just offers so much more precision, especially in rotary mode and especially when dealing with small areas. I can even get myself into the lip behind the door handle. I just have to be careful with the shroud getting too close to the handle. Now to wrap up day two, we discussed the advantage of employing the paint enhancement process using Uno Protect and how to best implement this process into our business. And then of course, Dylan demonstrated the process after which we implemented the process on our own test vehicles. Again, we are not just trying to polish, we are trying to leave something behind. Go a little heavy. Jesus. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna go to my go-to speed setting, I'm gonna be around four, okay? Not doing the priming thing, not doing all that other stuff. We are moving quick. So this application. I'm lifting slightly to get over gaps so I don't jam a bunch of stuff in there, but I'm going. Got here, kind of bunny hop the tracks. So I'll do it. I lift ever so slightly. Okay, so that'll just about do it for day two. Let's say goodbye to our instructors, Dylan, Paul, and Kyle, before we head out. So our instructors for the next two days are Dylan Van Kleist. You probably know him from uh, Rupes' uh, YouTube channel. You do the uh, 101, correct? Yep, the, Mark, the Bigfoot 101, the Rupes Reply series, among all the other stuff, and then uh, obviously here in training, I do the marketing, a little bit of everything. And then we've got uh, Kyle over here. Kyle's been uh, part of our support staff for the last couple days, so we appreciate everything he's done. Thank you very much. You bet. And uh, we got one other instructor. We're going to see if we can get him in front of the camera. I think he's out in the shop. Yeah, he should be. Yes. Paul. Paul's out there working. Let's go find Paul. Change. Let's go find Paul. And we've got our, uh, our other instructor. Uh, what's your name again? <laughs> <laughs> Francisco, this uh, is fun. Yes. It's Paul. Paul. Uh, Paul Weiler with Rupes USA, the field application specialist. Gotcha. You were with Rupes a long time, right? Uh, since 2016. 16. Yeah. Super knowledgeable, super awesome guy. So we appreciate uh, Paul, Kyle, and um, Dylan 
the last two days. Awesome course, highly recommend the course if you're looking to take your skills to the next level. And uh, that's it for our staff. So thanks for watching and we will see you later. I will say this before you put the shot button. Sure. You know, uh, Seth. Yeah. Because you're sitting right next to Lewis. So yeah, yeah. anyway, you had some really good questions that really came here with a mindset to learn. So well, thank you very much. That makes it more fun, more appreciative from the instructors cool. when the students are looking to learn. Yeah. So. Well, right. thank you for yes. teaching us everything. So. Absolutely. All right, guys, so we are done for the two days. We're walking out, and uh, my mind is officially blown. Head full of knowledge. I know every other student in there is going to agree with me, but uh, totally worth the money, totally worth the trip. And uh, if any of you guys are looking to expand your detailing knowledge in the world of paint correction, wet sanding, all that good stuff, I highly recommend the two-day course. The two-day course is for um, not for beginners. It is for uh, semi-professionals and professionals, those who have got experience. So thank you guys so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please don't hesitate to give it a like right down below. And if you haven't already, please don't forget to subscribe to our channel. That way you don't miss any future auto detailing content just like this. So as always, I'm Seth with Turner Mobile Detailing. Coming to you from Rupes in Colorado, USA. We'll see you in the next video.